Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you, my friends, my brothers and sisters in faith and humanity. This is your brother, uh, Adeyinka Muhammad Mendes, uh, who's your companion on this journey through the words and the wisdom of uh, the great sage, the great scholar, uh, Muhammad Jalaluddin Ar-Rumi, the great Imam. Uh, I pray you're all well. I hope you're, ble you're enjoying and benefiting uh, from this uh, blessed, blessed, blessed month of Ramadan. And uh, it's appropriate that we're going through uh, Rumi uh, on this, um, on, on this, in this month because his work is widely regarded as a, uh, a sort of commentary of sorts on the Quran, on the sacred Quran. Uh, so uh, it's very much appropriate. We're going through this uh, blessed text. <laughs> and, um, and before I get started, I want to say happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, uh, especially um, the, the mothers that are in uh, the house here. We have, a, we have one mother here. Uh, and all the grandmothers and uh, the mothers uh, who... Uh, may not have biological children, but they've been a motherly presence. They've been a motherly force in the lives of uh, others. Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, uh, said that paradise is at the feet of mothers. Al Jannah to Enda Akadam al Ummahat, that paradise is, lies at the feet of mothers. And, you know, when I think about that hadith, that saying, uh, I, I wonder if paradise is at her feet, then what is at her head, right? If paradise is at her feet, then what is at her heart? So we should, of course, you know, every day should be Mother's Day, right? Every day should be Mother's Day. We should show our mothers love and appreciation, right? We should show our mothers respect and we should support them, we should honor them, uh, we should uh, facilitate their own personal missions uh, and love them and empower them uh, to, to be uh, leaders in any arena of society that Allah, that the divine has created them to be leaders in. And so if your mother has passed away, then um, you definitely want to pray for your mother, not just today, but every day. Pray for her, uh, send her greetings of peace, uh, and then always uh, make sure that you live the kind of life that, that she would be uh, happy with, that she would be happy with. And uh, let's see, there's a few things in the chat here. Uh, uh, one of the brothers wrote, uh, Salam, Sheikh, Wa Alaikum Salam. Uh, I just want to let you know one of my friends who is a Christian from Brazil is attending today's class. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. Uh, everyone is welcome. Um, hola. And I'm not sure if that's an appropriate greeting. I know in Brazil they speak Portuguese. And uh, but you're, you're welcome. This is a, a gathering where everyone is welcome, whether you're Christian or not. Uh, whether you are here in the United States. <laughs> and uh, I have family that lives in uh, Rio, and Sao Paulo, and Bahia. And uh, you can probably tell from my last name that I have a Brazilian connection. And so uh, you're welcome here. You're welcome. This is a, a gathering of seekers, or you can say it's a conference of the birds. This is a conference of the birds, and the bird has always been a symbol in the in the Muslim tradition for the the spirit, for the soul, you know, because it soars high. It's it's in the sky. It's celestial. So the the unifying theme of what we've been learning uh, for the past a few days are the obstacles, right? the obstacles on your and my spiritual path. What uh, 
Dr. Muhammad Isaweli refers to as the foes in the battle, enemies of God and man. And I, I wanted to be very careful. Uh, there's a brother from uh, Imam Warthadi Muhammad's community, uh, God have mercy upon him, who told me a few years back, you know, be careful about calling your soul your enemy, right? Your, your nafs, your enemy. And, uh, you know, we had a conversation about that. Of course, that's a classical approach. As I said yesterday, there's four or five quote unquote enemies, or you could call them, I think more appropriately, obstacles on for your spiritual growth and development, right? And the first uh, is mentioned is the, the, the self, the ego. And what's meant specifically here is the lower ego. The ego is malleable, there's a spectrum, uh, but generally we talk about the higher self and the lower self. And so it's the lower self that actually is, a, uh, is an obstacle to our spiritual growth. And then there is Satan or the devil. May God protect us from him. And uh, he's also an obstacle on the path because what he does is suggest to us, and that's all he can do. He, he can't uh, harm you. Um, he does not have any authority over you uh, unless you listen to him, right? Unless, any, uh, unless a person listens to, to him. And so that whispering, that insinuation um, is how he fi finds his inroad, his entry way into our hearts. The third obstacle uh, is the hawa, is the, uh, are the, the passions, uh, our desires that uh, cater to the, uh, to the self, that incline, you know, towards uh, the lower self. And then we have what's called, this, the fourth is called a uh, dunya in Arabic, which refers to the lowest world which is the material world, right? The material world, if we see it as an end in itself, becomes an obstacle. The material world on, on its own is absolutely not an obstacle. In fact, it's one of the greatest means to discover the truth and to discover your truth, right? But when we become blinded by the glitter and the glamour of, of this world, of this material world, then they can become a stumbling block. And then lastly, uh, some of our sages, some of the great spiritual masters, they add a fifth, uh, which is khalq. And khalq here doesn't mean creatures. It refers specifically to human beings. That human beings can be an obstacle on your path, again, the human is noble. The human is beautiful. The human is powerful. The human is sacred. And, and God uh, mentions in the Quran, in the sacred Quran, that he has honored all human beings. In Arabic, A'udhu Bilay Mina Shaitan Rajim, after seeking uh, protection from God, from the accursed Satan, Laqad Karamna Bani Adam. God says, We have absolutely honored, we've ennobled all of the children of Adam. And this is regardless of uh, their religion, their race, the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status. Every child of Adam, every son, every daughter of Adam has nobility. But when our self, when the nafs becomes attached to human beings, as again, um, an end in themselves, uh, then all kinds of problems happen. When we see our relationships with one another as human beings um, as uh, absolute and not uh, relative, when we don't understand that you know, every human being is a, an expression of God's names and attributes, um, it can cause, again, lots of uh, 
uh, problems in our own spiritual growth and development. And we talked a bit about that yesterday. And uh, so those are the five obstacles on the path. And we've dealt with uh, two of them. And today we're kind of you know, drilling in, we're going in a bit further into the self. So yesterday we talked about the animal soul, which is connected to the self. And to, today we're going to be talking about subduing the self, right? So uh, Ada, I'm not, uh, I think, I hope I'm saying that right. Ada is from Brazil, which is famous for its Brazilian Jiu Jitsu martial arts practitioners, right? And one of the goals on the mat when you're doing BJJ uh, is to, you know, get a submission, you know, from your opponent, to subdue your opponent, to get them to tap out, right? To get them to tap out. <laughs> and so, and so this uh, particular uh, section is about getting yourself, getting your soul, getting the ego to tap out, right? And uh, often when we talk about uh, our lower self, you know, what we should be doing with our, lo our lower self, the great masters mention that you should be struggling with it. Mujahada to nafs, right? You, you struggle against it or you're struggling with it because it's, it's actually quite, it's a mutual. <laughs> and and it, in, in this month of Ramadan, when we're fasting and, you know, we're, we're hungry, we're thirsty, and maybe your body's weak, uh, you, you've, you've tasted a sense of that struggling, right? There's a push and there's a pull. You know, you deprive the self of food and drink during the day. And in the evening, it wants to, you know, have a second or a third plate, for example, or drink or eat foods that are, you know, not that healthy. And so you have to restrain it. And, and don't think that the, the self is going to welcome your bridling it, like you bridle a horse, you know, you put the bit in the horse's mouth and try to keep it. You know, no, no, it doesn't want to be restrained. The, the self doesn't want to be restrained. It, 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 it wants to be like the spirit. It wants to be completely free, right? That's the, but the problem with the self is when the self, when you give the self complete freedom, it usually ends up uh, going beyond healthy limits. It usually wants to be indulged and it wants to be fed and catered to and catered to and catered to till it's sick, right? until it gets sick. And uh, so that's what, because the self doesn't know when to stop. Halmin Mazid, right? Is there any more? Right? That's what that's what hell asks, right? In the Quran. Hell asks God, is there anyone else? All right, can I give me more? Give me more. And and because hell is an extension or manifestation of the lower self, uh, it asks the same question, right? At whether whatever the desire is, whether it's the desire for money, whether it's the desire for fame, whether it's the desire for food and drink, whether it's the desire for power and control and influence, the nafs, the self is always asking, is there more, right? Is there more? Halmin mazid, is there more? And so spirituality is about learning to curb that, uh, that, you know, um, desire for more from this world. All you need from this world is a little. You just take what you need. You just take what you need. And that, you know, especially in light of the environmental crisis with climate change, like that makes sense on many levels, right? Take what you need so that, number one, the self doesn't become sick. Take what you need so that you don't inhibit, you don't stop your spirit from being able to shine in this, in this plane of existence, in this dimension. Take what you need so that there's enough for the seven generations that, that are coming after you, as our uh, indigenous Native American brothers and sisters say. Just take what you need. 
subduing the self. So first, as always, we'll read from the words of the, the great spiritual guide, our companion, our teacher, uh, Muhammad Jalaluddin Arumi. And today we're reading from the first volume of the Mesnawi and uh, verses 1,373 to 1,376. O kings, right? and I would add queens, right? O kings and queens, we have killed the outward enemy, but within us remains a worse enemy than him. Slaying this enemy, slaying this foe, is not a task for reason and intelligence. The lion within cannot be overcome by a hare. <laughs> The lion within cannot be overcome, overcome by a hare, right? A hare is a, a wild rabbit, basically, right? A wild rabbit. Rabbit can defeat a lion. The ego is hell, and hell is a dragon. The ego, the self, is hell. He doesn't even say it's like hell. He just goes straight, you know, like this, the ego is hell. <laughs> and by this, again, we mean the lower self. And if you've studied Western psychology, the word ego has a different meaning in uh, Muslim psychology, right? So ego here is uh, referring, again, to the shadow. Uh, if, you're familiar, if you're familiar with Western psychology, we're talking about what Carl Jung described as the shadow, right? The shadow self, all the things uh, that we suppress and repress and we dislike about ourselves, all the things that we're ashamed of, all of our, all the things we just wanna, you know, when, when people come into the house of our heart, we wanna keep all that stuff in the, you know, in the closet. We wanna <laughs> unlock the closet behind us, right? You don't want those guests to see that part of you, right? That's what we call the ego, the self, uh, the psyche, the persona even, right? Um, but again, these words that are used in Western psychology are not, sometimes they're not helpful, right? But uh, I think shadow is, uh, is helpful than most other words. So. When we talk about the ego here, we're talking about the shadow. The shadow is hell, right? The shadow. All your lower base desires that have no other aspiration except to consume, right? To be, uh, to be known, to be recognized, to consume and be recognized, right? Like fire, right? What does fire do? Where fire goes up high and it just devours everything in its path. Like that is this, the, the self, the lower self. And it, that manifests in many different ways. So, so, so when you think of uh, the word, when you think of the word, uh, the nafs, right, in Arabic, the self, then imagine a fire, for example, you know, and a fire. Again, it, it, it spreads, it, it devours everything in its path, it burns up everything in its path, it causes a lot of destruction. Um, it's very elevated, right? So there's, there's pride and, and arrogance that comes with that. Uh, and then, but also, um, you know, what happens when a fire uh, ravages uh, a neighborhood or uh, a forest? You know, again, we have a guest from Brazil. The Amazon's been on fire, right? When a volcano erupts, uh, long term, it's a purification, right? It's a purification for new growth, uh, for new life. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that the Amazon burning is a good is a good sign. That's actually a very, it's a terrible sign, all right, of what we've done wrong and our mismanagement of that incredible uh, sign of God, the Amazon forest. 
But again, I want you to just think of this metaphor um, because the tendency is actually to see your ego as something very positive. We love ourselves, right? The, the natural response of the human being is that we are absolutely head over heels in love with ourselves, the lower self and the higher self, because it's part of us. We love it. You know, you look in the mirror and you don't see the blemishes. You don't see the imperfections. You see the, you know, all the, you know, the, the beauty, right? If the eye of the heart is not awake. So he says, this ego, this lower self is hell. I don't think hell is something that's coming, you know, after death, you know, that's coming after judgment day. No, the ego is hell right now. And if you're living through ego, if you're living through the, the lower self, you're in hell already. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wayne Dyer, who is a famous uh, self-help guru, some of you may be familiar with his work for you know many decades. He helped people uh, all over the world uh, really discover their highest human potential or, or aspects of it, rather, I would say, aspects of their uh, higher human potential. He was a Taoist. He wasn't Muslim. Um, but he very insightful, very wise. And, and um, of course, as, a, as you know, everything he says is not in harmony with our tradition, the Muslim tradition. But again, he offered many great insights. And one of the things he said about the word ego, he said that the word ego as far as he was concerned, was an acronym that stood for edging God out. That at the beginning of our journey, of our adventure on this planet, we depended on God. We depended on religion, on spirituality, that we, we needed that as our compass, and we needed that as our, as our shelter, our food, our clothing. It was everything for us. And as we began to uh, gain greater uh, knowledge of material sciences and, technologi and technological advancement, we pushed God out. We edged God out now thinking that we were independent. And this diagnosis that he made is very much in line with what we're told by the creator, by the divine in the sacred Quran. Indeed, the human being has gone beyond the limits, has transgressed. He thinks that he doesn't need us, right? He thinks he's independent, right? Like your children, right, when they turn 15, right? They think they don't need you, right? Uh, so the ego is hell, and hell is a dragon. Okay, so why a dragon? Those of you who've joined us before, you're familiar again that uh, I, I, really, uh, I really enjoy uh, Joseph Campbell and you know, Carl Jung and mythology. And so in, myth, in myths around the world, the dragon is a, is a symbol for the lower self. So when you're watching Lord of the Rings, for example, you know, with, what is his name, Frodo? Is it Frodo? Frodo? My children don't watch Lord of the Rings. They're, they're into other stuff. <laughs> but I think it's Frodo, um, the hobbit, who in one of the Lord of the Rings, he has to go to the mountain and face the dragon, right? And, and we see this in many different fairy tales and myths. The dragon is not just some you know, creature that they invented. Uh, and you're like, oh, dragons don't exist. You know, some people turn this into a whole, you know, do, or do you know, does, does, what does the Quran or what does the Bible say about the existence of dragons or dinosaurs? And No, that's not the point. The point is that this is a creature, right? That, that, that has the qualities of a, of a snake and a bird, right? which is what the self is, right? It has the qualities of a snake. And we talked about 
the snake. Very early on, right, in this month, the snake is that which inclines to the earth. It slithers on land. But the bird, like a dragon that has wings, can go what? Can go up high. And so the dragon represents the potential of the human self and the struggle of the human self. Part snake, part bird, right? And it breeds fire. It breeds out fire, right? Which again represents the desires, right? The destructive nature of the desires. And it's really important, my friends, that when you're, when you're reading these stories to your children or you're showing them a, a movie um, and there are these different uh, creatures in them, fan, you know, fantasy creatures, it's a lot deeper than most people think, right? What the storyteller, whether it's a modern storyteller, a screenwriter, or if it's a story that's been passed down for thousands of years, they are, they are always, they are always communicating deep principles and truths through those stories because human beings love stories. Human beings are, they, they are more receptive to truth that is clothed in the language of stories. Now the last, uh, the, and then the, the next part of this couplet is this. So he says, this ego is hell, and hell is a dragon when, whose fire cannot be quenched by oceans of water, right? So the rabbit can't defeat the lion, and, and this dragon, the fire of this dragon, cannot be quenched by even oceans of water. We're not talking about buckets. Oceans of water cannot quench this dragon. You can give the self, you can give your ego, right, which always wants to edge God out of your life, of the world, right, of religion even. You, and even for religious people, you see that there's this, you know, again, battle to, to push God out of religion and to make religion a tool for political and economic and social ambitions and power. It's the same thing. Just because someone's religious uh, or outwardly pious doesn't mean that they've overcome their ego. That fire with oceans and oceans and oceans and oceans and oceans of water cannot be quenched, right? The ego is a hyper consumer. If you want to use economic marketing terms, it is a hyper consumer. It will shop and shop until it, 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 it drops. And the last couplet he says here, it could drink up the seven seas. It could drink up the seven seas, yet still the fire of that creature devour would not become less. He, so he's teaching us about ourselves, all right? He's teaching us about the self. So we'll go right into the commentary. The commentator, uh, Dr. Muhammad Isa Whaley, who's, a, who's an English, uh, English Muslim and uh, an expert on Turkish and Persian manuscripts. He worked at the British Library and the B British Museum for 45 years. <clears throat> God protect him and benefit us through his knowledge. He says, in Sufi literature, we often read that vanquishing external enemies is easier than subduing one's own demons. In Sufi literature, we often read that vanquishing external enemies is easier than subduing one's own inner demons, the demons that are in here. Right? And many of us in this month of fasting, right, we, we become acquainted with our inner demons because we know from the, uh, the uh, informing of our beloved prophet, God bless him and grant him peace, Prophet Muhammad, that 
the devils are shackled, are shackled in this month. They are imprisoned in this month. But the inner devils, right? <laughs> the meaning the qualities that are satanic, that are demonic in us, the deception, you know, the the uh, the uh, desire to dominate others, right? To deceive others. We become acquainted with what's in our own hearts. So what's a Sufi, right? So he starts with this word Sufi, and we really haven't spoken much about it. Uh, and a lot of Muslims misunderstand the word Sufi. The word Sufi uh, is a word that was used early, early, early on by Muslims it was not, as far as uh, we know, um, used by Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace. We don't have any narration. There's no authenticated uh, wisdom saying from him that uses that word. And as all of you know, that's not a word that's in the Quran either. So why, what is this word Sufi? What is a Sufi? And it's important because a lot of Muslims have uh, bad experiences. Um, with people who call themselves Sufis. There are Muslims that um, have been warned against uh, su you know, being a Sufi or associating with Sufis, especially in the modern age. Um, and, and there's all these things online you know, that, that really disparage Sufis. And uh, for me, early on, uh, I was given a very, I think, healthy and very balanced understanding of what a Sufi is. And the best person to ask what a Sufi is, is to ask a Sufi, <laughs> right? And so uh, the word actually, um, one of our great, 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 great scholars, um, Ahmed Zarouk, who is from Morocco, he has a book called The Principles of Tasawwuf. And in that book, and tasawwuf is a, is a science, it's a, it's a spiritual science that um, is based on becoming a Sufi, right? Becoming a Sufi. And he says there's over 2,000 definitions for the word Sufi that have been given and had, that have been shared uh, by different scholars and different sages. Over 2,000, he says. And he mentions some of them. He said, but all of them, all of them, come down to one thing, the sincerity of one's journeying, the sincerity of one's orienting their heart towards the divine. That is at the core of every definition. All the 2,000 plus de definitions of the word Sufi Siddiq at-tawajjuh illallah. Siddiq means honesty, transparency. It's the truthfulness. Tawajjuh literally means an inward facing. It's a reflexive verb in Arabic. And it means to face one's attention inside. Inside. It's not this face. It's, it's in here. It's in the heart. So it's... Facing the God, facing the Creator, with from within. Right. Now, religion, religion teaches us a lot about how to face God with our public face, right? But uh, the path of the Sufi is about uh, facing God with your soul, right? With your heart, with the spirit. Now, the word comes from, again, there's many theories about, you know, the etymology of the word, the origin of the word. Uh, some say it's from Safa, which means purity in Arabic. Some say it's from Suf, uh, which means wool. We talked about this yesterday, I think, uh, in Arabic, because the early Sufis would wear wool, wool patched robes because of how uncomfortable wool is, you know. Um, and, and 
and uh, yes, I was about to mention that. Thank you, uh, Chaplain Kamau. And some scholars say that the word Sufi comes from Ahlu Sufa, which were uh, a group of about a hundred or so companions of Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, who would stay on the, the Sufa. The Sufa was a raised, a raised, uh, I guess you could call it a raised platform that was just behind uh, his living quarters. If you go to Medina today, um, the area outside of the columns, right? It's, it's actually written. It tells you, this is where the people of the veranda, or the sufa, of the raised platform used to stay. And these were uh, uh, people who were, um, you know, poor, right? They were poor. They, they weren't able to stand on their own feet fi financially. Um, and so they lived at the mosque. So the, the, the mosque of Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, was also a shelter, right? All right and and, and I'm, I don't think I've found in my almost 30 years practicing Islam, I don't think I've seen one mosque that's designed that way. Now I'm not saying there aren't any, I hope there are some, but I haven't come across any mosque that made that accommodate, that, that, that in their design, They've made that accommodation, which is a part of the prophetic design. And my prayer is that we build mosques that can be, that do have shelters, right? And of course, that comes with lots of liability and responsibility, right? That's, that's a given. But Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, he loved these people. He loved them so much. Abu Huraira lived in the Sufa. Uh, Bilal lived in the Sufa. And so many other uh, great you know, giants, but they weren't just poor Muslims. These were people that actually had uh, devoted themselves to learning from Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace. They had devoted themselves to study, deep study and education. They were also people that had dedicated themselves to a, a spiritual practice of dhikr, of invocation of God. And the, the verse in the chapter of the cave, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكْ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Make your soul patient with those who invoke their master, their divine master, in the morning and the evening, seeking nothing but his essence, the face of God. Right? We're talking about the face again. But this time, these people, the Sufa, uh, the people of the raised platform, the elevated platform, <clears throat> there are people that are calling on God, not because they, you know, they want to be rich or they want to, they're, they're looking for health or not, not because they want power, but they just want to discover the essence, the divine essence. They want to be conscious of the divine essence. They want the face of God. They, they're looking for sincerity. And these people were also the very, very first. If there was um, a battle, if there was some expedition that needed to go out, they were the first to go, right? So they had a very deep commitment. Uh, and, and, they would, and the prophet, God bless him and grant him peace, would, he, would, he would take care of them. He would make sure they had food. If he was given any gift, he would take it to them first. He would share it with them first. And a lot of times, because Prophet Muhammad, God bless him, a grand peace, never accepted charity. And his family never accepted charity. Never. And anyone who's a descendant of Prophet Muhammad, God bless him, a grand peace, should not accept charity. But he would accept gifts, and he would always take those gifts first to uh, the people of the raised platform. And a lot of times, his family would, um, you know, go without, right, go without, because he always preferred them. And so they had a very high status. And uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas, who was uh, a great, great modern 20th century spiritual guide uh, from Senegal, he, he writes in his memoirs. So he would go on these journeys, and he would always, you know, after the journeys, Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas, God be pleased with him, he would write a, um, 
I guess, a uh, travel autobiography of the journey, right? So if you went to Morocco or, or if you went to India or, you know, if you went to Paris, to France, he'd write about his journey and that would be published. And, you know, the insights that in the experiences, one time he was uh, in Paris and he writes, and he was, a, he was a masterful poet. He writes, I saw a vision of Prophet Muhammad when I was in Paris, right? Like he's had a waking vision of Prophet Muhammad on the streets of Paris. And he said in the, in the poem, he asks rhetorically, is, is the Prophet, you know, someone that should be seen in Paris? <laughs> you know, like the Prophet Sallallahu seeing his spirit can happen anywhere, anywhere, right? I even know of a brother who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Philadelphia, in, 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 in Texas. And, you know, so having a vision of the Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, is not limited to being in a Muslim country, right? As some people think that, you know. Anyway, so uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas, uh, he, when he made Hajj, when he made the pilgrimage to Mecca, he said his favorite place, his favorite place after the Roba, right? After being in the Roba in Medina, right? When he would go to, you know, Mecca is where we make pilgrimage and then we, we make our a sacred visit to Medina, you know, to greet and to bask in the radiance of the Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace and his, uh, co his companions who are, who are buried there because even after death, their body, their bodies, since their bodies are connected with their spirits uh, and their bodies, many of them, uh, particularly Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, and Abu Bakr and Omar and, you know, these companions of like this high spiritual, spiritual uh, level, you, the body becomes spiritualized. The body, uh, like one of the sages said, our bodies are our spirits and our spirits are our bodies. Like there's no difference now. Like you reach a level on the spiritual path where the body and the spirit fuse. The body and the spirit fuse. And if you understand that possibility, you understand many of the uh, miracles of the Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace. And the you know amazing things you hear about really saintly people, their bodies being buried for years, decades. And then for some reason, the body has to be exhumed, exhumed from the ground. And people find the bodies of these people are, you know, they're just, they're, they're fresh, they're supple. They're, they're some, you know, they're not like they, you know, like they haven't, they haven't decomposed. You know, bodies that have not decomposed. We have uh, records of that throughout our history, right? Up to the modern, up to modern times. Why? Because the bodies of those very righteous people, these men and women, these children, the body is colored with the attributes of the spirit and the spirit does not decompose. The spirit does not die. The spirit uh, cannot, uh, you know, be traumatized. The spirit cannot be injured. And so that's what a Sufi is. So he loved to be in the raised platform area after the Roba, which is usually very crowded, because he said, that's the area of my ancestors used to sit. And by ancestors here, he's not talking about biological ancestors. He was Senegalese, right? He was Wolof. But he's talking about his spiritual ancestors, his spiritual ancestors, Ahlu Sufa, the people of the raised platform. And so that's, that was his favorite place after, of course, the, the roba, the meadow, the heavenly meadow of the Prophet Sallallahu that's between his pulpit and his, uh, the place where he's buried. So if we look at the Quran and we look at the Hadith literature, the, the words of uh, the beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings rest upon him, the word that scholars say is uh, um, that, it, that, that captures this, this reality we've been talking about 
of sincerity of orient inward orientation towards God is ihsan, ihsan, which literally means in English to make oneself or to make something beautiful, to make something good. And so part of Islam, we know there's a long hadith called the hadith of Gabriel, the hadith of the angel Gabriel, peace be upon him, in which Gabriel disguised as a human being comes and asks Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a series of questions. Tell me about Islam, tell me about Iman, tell me about Ihsan, and when is the last hour, when is judgment day, and what are its signs? Would tell me about surrendering to God, willing surrender. Tell me about trust in God, about faith. Tell me about faith. Tell me about becoming good, becoming beautiful. So Ihsan is this becoming beautiful. It is that inward, again, facing towards God. And the answer, the answer of the prophet, peace and blessings rest upon him, was this, that becoming beautiful or becoming good is that one devote themselves to God, humbly devote themselves to God as if they are looking at God, as if they're beholding God, as if they're seeing God. And if you cannot see God, know that he is gazing at you. Right. This is Sufism. So all the other stuff that you may have heard about Sufism, right? Uh, you know, whether it's people, you know, uh, you know, saying things or doing things that look like that, it has nothing to do with Islam. What a Sufi is, is a person who is striving to become beautiful on the inside, right? Beautiful in their heart. And the last thing I want to say about this is that our scholars, again, you should define a term by its practitioners and by those who've really investigated and researched the matter. And so Sufism basically has three parts, or Tosawwuf has three parts. And those three parts are the refining of one's character and the purifying of one's character from ugly traits, blameworthy traits like pride, arrogance, conceit, jealousy, uh, showing off, and uh, anger or rage that is self-serving, not for the cause of truth. And adorning or beautifying, right? And then the second aspect of, of uh, the Sufi path um, is beautifying the self, beautifying the heart with praiseworthy qualities, with virtues, like turning to, back to God in every situation, generosity, uh, truthfulness, um, reverence for God, um, honoring others, serving others, right? And so on and so forth. And then the third aspect of, of the Sufi way or the Sufi path is spiritual enlightenment. It is the enlightenment of the soul. It is the enlightenment of the heart. Right? So uh, with knowledge, divine knowledge, with divine wisdom, uh, it's, an, it's an enlightenment of the, of the soul that leads to a person now being able to, uh, their consciousness is now expanded beyond the physical, and now their consciousness includes the spiritual universe, all right? And it is at that point that they are really able to uh, realize their full potential as a human being, okay? So Rumi was a Sufi, right? Rumi was a Sufi, Imam al-Ghazali was a Sufi, Imam al nawi was a Sufi. All of, the, all of these people were Sufis. And they all teach that to tr truly be a Sufi, one must live their lives according to the Quran, and one must live their lives according to the path of the prophets, right? From Adam to Prophet Muhammad, God bless him, them all. From Adam to 
Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus Christ, the son of uh, the blessed Mary, uh, to Muhammad. God bless them all and grant them peace. Okay? So that's just a little bit about what it means to be a Sufi. So the Sufis have their literature. And in their literature, it's always easier to overcome the enemies that are outside of you than the enemies that are inside of you. He goes on to say that the ego, the nafs in Arabic, in Hebrew, the nafsh, is powerful, devious, resourceful, and persistent. Attempts to overcome such an adversary by means of mental operations are unlikely to succeed. Some people think that they can think themselves or they can use mental, their mental acumen to purify their hearts, <clears throat> to become better people. And they struggle and they struggle and they struggle for years. Islam is not a DIY project, right? And spirituality is absolutely not a do-it-yourself project, right? You cannot use mental, you cannot use uh, academic smarts or street smarts to, to outsmart the ego. It's, it's too, too, too intelligent. <laughs> you will always fail. If confronted with a dragon, the poet Arumi tells us, one must fight fire with fire. Can't use water. Can't use water, can't use oceans. The sources testify that many Sufi masters subjected themselves and their disciples to forms of self-mortification more rigorous than most of us can picture ourselves surviving. <laughs> much less prospering on. Yeah, when you read these stories, like if you just pick up Imam al-Ghazali's Ihya al Madin, you know, these look like superhuman feats of spirituality that they used to do in the past. You know, people would go, you know, 40 days without eating. You know, not, not fasting Ramadan, just, you know, I mean, not, and literally, you know, people would, uh, you know, tie themselves to, to columns so that they wouldn't go to sleep at night and they would just spend the whole night praying. And they would do that, not one night, not two nights. They would do that for weeks, right? No sleep. And, I mean, even some of the simpler things like going for 40 years without salt, many of us would die from that. What, no salt in my food? You're right. No seasoning, <laughs> right? no spices, uh, you know, no, no adobo, no Tony Saturies. Oh, we'd die. <laughs> you know, things like that just boggle our minds, right? 40 years, no seasoning in your food. Why did they go through all this? To deny the self its pleasures. Because when the self is denied, it, 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 it withers away. The animal soul that we talked about yesterday weakens. And now the heart, the spirit becomes more powerful in its presence in this world. Maulana, our master, Jalaluddin, was himself a highly accomplished Zahid or ascetic, right? And we talked about the ascetic before, that the ascetic is not necessarily someone who is poor, but the ascetic is someone who is poor before God. They're, they may be a billionaire, they might be a millionaire, but their heart, their heart, their heart is not attached. The ascetic is detached from the material world, from its comforts. They don't care, right, if the, the, the house, you know, um, is, uh, you know, uh, carpeted and has all the accessories and, you know, has um, the creature comforts and amenities that come with living in a, you know, a, a million dollar home. They'll, they'll, they're very happy to live in a million dollar home or to live in a, a shack, right? Made out of 
wood or metal or a tent under a bridge, they don't care about that kind of stuff. Right? Wherever God facilitates, whatever God makes uh, possible for them, they're absolutely content because they have faith. Faith makes you content. Faith is not just your life raft when you're, the boat of your ambitions is sinking, which is how a lot of people live their lives, right? Thinking faith is just my plan B, right? If things don't, really, faith, faith is more like a plan Z. When everything else fall, fails and everything else falls, we you know, hope that our faith will take us to safety, right, through life. But if you haven't cultivated your faith, you can, you'll jump off the Titanic of your material ambitions and there's no life raft and drown. So the disciples in these Sufi men, well, now what's a disciple? So again, I know most of you are Muslim and you might hear the word disciple and that might, again, what is this going on? It's appeared in his disciples or, uh, you know, what's a disciple. The word disciple just means someone who's being trained. That's all it means. If you look at the word, it's etymology. It just means someone who's being educated, someone who's being disciplined. The word discipline and disciple come from the same root. And ultimately discipline, when you discipline yourself, when you discipline a child, you're educating them, you are training them. And when you discipline the soul, when you discipline the ego, so the word disciple uh, is not a bad word, right? It's, it just means someone who's made a commitment to self-purification uh, and self-beautification so that God will, uh, they hopefully grant them the gift of self-illumination, of enlightenment. These are the three aspects of the Sufi path, right? In Arabic, they're called, it's takhliya, Tahliya and Tajliya, purification, beautification, and illumination of the heart. Today, however, people are generally far less robust, and the emphasis is more often on training the self more gently and diplomatically by keeping its desires from excessive indulgence and exercising them strictly within the bounds of sacred law. Because modern human beings they would just, you know, like I said, you know, no adobo, no salt, no, you know, curry and pepper. And I mean, you know, I grew up in Nigeria partly, right? And I remember, you know, the, you know, those of you that are that are from Pakistan or India or Bangladesh, you know, the 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 food, the spiciness of your food is nothing compared to Nigerian food. All right, nothing. It's that doesn't even compare. And I remember my friend telling me, he said, if, if the food isn't you know, seasoned with the kind of those like fiery dragon, dragon pepper, you know, spices, he said, it tastes like paper. He said, I can't eat it. I can't eat it, right? And so modern spiritual masters are often more gentle with how they discipline their disciples, discipline their students, <clears throat> preventing them from overindulging or uh, encouraging them and facilitating strict adherence to the sacred law, right? To Sharia, to the, to the divine path. Fighting fire with water, so to speak, right? Not fire with fire. <clears throat> there is a risk that the self is subjected to, be, to more pressure than it can handle. There is a risk that the self, if subjected to more pressure than it can handle, it might rebel. It may rebel and lead its owner into a potentially disastrous state of imbalance. And that, that happens with people, right? They go too hard. They go too hard against themselves and it causes mental illness, mental imbalance. Um, you know, and you know, not just and then it, it may cause imbalance uh, in their in their family life. Right? We even in the time of Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace. There were companions who 
you know, they just went hard. They went hard against themselves. You know, married people, you know, not having uh, relations with their spouse. People fasting continuously, continuously, and not breaking their fast. And, you know, people staying up all night, all the time. And he told them, you know, and, and you know, of course, wives complained, right, about these guys, about these people. May Allah be pleased with them. And uh, when he heard about these complaints about these great companions who were just, again, too, they were overzealous in trying to purify themselves, right? He said, you know, your body has rights. Your body has rights over you. Your wife, your spouse has rights over you, right? He said, I have more knowledge of God than all of you. I am more conscious and aware of God than all of you. And he wasn't saying this to brag or boast. He never did that. But he wanted to drill a point home to these uh, men who had really transgressed the limits. He said, you know, I'm, I marry. I marry women, right? And I have relations with my wives. I eat and I break my fast. I sleep and I observe night vigil prayers, right? So and you need to have some balance, right? You were, again, the, the, the body and the self are not considered evil in the Muslim tradition. Rather, those energies need to be channeled constructively and positively. So why is it, he says, that reasoning alone is normally ineffectual it's of no it has no effect in subduing the domineering tendencies of the anafs al-amara the imperious self the self the part the lowest ego the ego has seven levels we've talked about these already and at the very lowest is what's called the self that incites the evil that's mentioned in the story of joseph that's in the quran peace and blessings be upon prophet joseph uh, joseph the son of jacob God bless them both. And this self is the self that is completely bestial. It is a complete monster. That lower self, it only is concerned with satisfying its lowest appetites for food, for drink, uh, for sex at any cost, no matter who gets hurt, no matter what religious duties are neglected the nafs al amara is the it's the it's the tyrannical self it is the animal self it is the demonic self and uh whenever you find a human being who will go to any length to satisfy their desires that is someone who's existing at that level that's a very low level and it's a very dangerous level. And all the problems we have in the world, all the crime we have in the world, all the corruption that we have in the world at every level, from the street corner to the corner offices in these Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 corporations, from the, uh, you know, from the crack house to the White House, all the problems come down to this level of very, very low consciousness the nafs al-amara, right? And he says, the mind tends to resort to reason, to reason, to justify any desires that arise, always. You see it with children, right? Why'd you hit him? Uh, they, you know, hit me first, or, you know, they looked at me a certain way, or they didn't share, you know, their cupcake with me, or, right, you know, but adults do the same thing. Adults do the same thing, right? You have adults that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who are just as resentful, just as uh, vindictive, just as spiteful as a three-year-old, right? Stop talking about the terrible twos and the terrible threes. We have people, you know, terrible 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds and 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds, right? 
50 year olds and 40 year olds. Right? It's, a, it's a particular nafs, it's a kind of nafs. And so the hope is that by the time you reach your 40s, there's been some refinement, there's been some purification and some beautification. So you don't become um, a source of uh, uh, terror for others. You don't become a, uh, yeah, so now. The mind, the reason why it doesn't, you're using your mind, your smarts doesn't work is because you always, you and me, our tendency is to justify any of our desires and to prompt ourselves to gratify them. It is therefore necessary to have recourse to a higher faculty to cut off or better prevent this process. That faculty is the heart, the qalb, the dil, the kur. I'm not sure of the Spanish or Portuguese word for heart, which can be purified by the remembrance of God. So the heart is the only thing, the only faculty that can help you against the self. Not your head, not your head, the heart. And, but the heart needs to be purified. How is the heart purified? By lots of remembrance of God, lots of dhikr Allah, lots of chanting, of God's names and God's attributes <clears throat> and calling on those names and attributes, lots of praise and glorification of God. And by keeping company with the pure hearted, keeping company with people whose hearts are pure, preferably in person, right? Not through the internet, but preferably being physically in their presence, their, their radiant presence, but alternatively by reading or listening to the words. Now, if you don't have a pure-hearted person that you can, that you can uh, spend time with, that you can have fellowship with, then reading their books and listening to their words or watching videos of such people is also beneficial, but it's not the same as being in their presence. Try this and see, he says. If you are with people for whom this lower world, the dunya, is their overwhelming concern, the most important thing to them is this world and its concerns, then this world and its concerns will probably feel, start to fill your mind. And the next world and the life of the spirit will seem to shrink right down. And that's how you know if someone is pure hearted. If you spend time with them and after spending time with them, you notice a, a kind of constriction in your heart. You feel like, yeah, there are lots of problems in the world, and those problems are overwhelming. I'm nothing compared to all these, you know, economic, political, social problems. That's a sign that that person is, you know, uh, they're still, their consciousness is focused on this world. It doesn't mean they're a bad person, right? I want to be clear, that doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that their focus, their consciousness uh, has not expanded right, to the spirit, spiritual matters. Sit with people whose overwhelming concern is their spiritual life and the next life, and you will experience the opposite. God says in the Quran, be ever conscious of God and be with the sincere. What the law? Wa kunu ma'asadiqeen. In the Quran, the chapter, ninth chapter, Verse 119. So beautiful, right? And every verse of the Quran is beautiful. He said, God says, be conscious of God and keep company with those who are truthful, meaning truthful in spirit. They're the same in public and in private. You know, they're, they're, they're the same with God and with God's creatures. In the first line, the poet says, O oh, kings, remember when I first started reading, it said, O oh, kings. He is addressing those who are devoted to the Sufi path. Right? So a lot of times in Sufi writings, they refer to those people who are devoted to the spiritual life, to the life of the heart, <clears throat> as kings and queens. Salatin, right? Abu Madian mentions this in his famous poetry poem. You know, that 
uh, fuqara that uh, the delight of life, or you could even say the pleasure of life, the deliciousness of life is in keeping company with the poor. He's not talking about people that are, you know, living, uh, you know, uh, on welfare or people that are destitute. No, he's talking about the, like the Sermon on the Mount, those that are poor in spirit, those, the, the faqir, the ones who realize their poverty before the wealth of God, before the wealth of the, of the spirit, right? Um, you know, the, uh, the wealth of the spirit comes from its closeness to God, right? And so that's what is meant by the poor. <laughs> he said, the, the, the pleasure of life is in keeping company with those who realize their poverty in the divine presence. They are the true, they are the true kings. They are the true queens. They are the true rulers of this world. And they are the true commanders, right? Beautiful, it's a beautiful poem. Maybe one day we'll read it, inshallah. So he's addressing those who are devoted to the Sufi path of whom it is often said that they are inwardly kings and queens Whatever their social status, they may be millionaires and they may have nothing in their bank account. They are still kings and queens. And their outward condition, regardless of their social status and outward condition, whereas devotee, devotees of the worldly life, those people whose main ambition and concern in life are this world, they are poor in that they never feel that they have enough. They are poor because they are never content. They are poor because they are never satisfied, because the self is never satisfied. The ego is never satisfied. Uh, there's a saying, there's a proverb in Arabic, that contentment is a treasure that never, never uh, ends. So we ask God for contentment and we ask God to help us subdue our lower selves. Uh, it should be said uh, before I open up for your comments and your questions that our spiritual masters are unanimous that your greatest obstacle, you can even say, you can even say your greatest foe, your greatest enemy is not the devil is not Satan. Your greatest obstacle is your own self. The only thing between you and God is your own self. The only thing that's preventing you and me from uh, witnessing the divine presence is our own lower self. And Ramadan, Ramadan, this blessed month of Ramadan, this blessed month of uh, fasting and prayer and charity is uh, number one, an opportunity for us to truly see ourselves. Again, the devils are shackled, they're locked up, they're in prison. And now that the devils are gone, you can really see who you are, right? You can look in the mirror and see where you're at. Is your focus this world or is your focus the spirit, right? Ramadan is also, it's not just a, a great opportunity for self-knowledge, uh, but it's also a great opportunity for purification of the self. Right? If, again, we are observing it as it should be observed. And I talked a lot about this before Ramadan started. You know, our teachers, our scholars say, if you're fasting Ramadan, if you're going hungry all day, you're thirsty all day, but then at night, you are pigging out. At night, you're having these, you know, you, you, you have a full plate of food and you're drinking and drinking and tea and this and soda. And I, you know, I don't even know how a person can drink soda in Ramadan. I don't know, I, that, I don't know, I don't understand how that's possible. But, and then, you know, you get one plate and then a second plate, you know, then you go pray, tarawih, 
And then after Tarawih, you have another snack or whatever, you know, you, you're making up, yourself is, is making up for, for the 15, 16, 17, 18 hours, depending on where you live in the world, that you went without eating. And so you took three steps forward, and now you've taken seven steps backwards. And who can get to their destination like that? Right, so use this month. I mean, really, my advice to you, if you're not, if you don't have some chronic illness or, you know, people that are hypoglycemic or diabetic, uh, they, they have unique challenges, okay? Uh, women who are pregnant or nursing have unique dietary needs. But if that is not you, if you are relatively healthy, I am, I'm asking you for your own sake, for the rest of the month, if you're like I, if you're a person like I just described, you've been like really, you know, having a good time for iftar, <laughs> having your, you know, really rich meals, and then you know, eating, you know, beyond. If your stomach feels full, and you know, I mean, you know, then you're not fasting Ramadan. You're not really doing Ramadan correctly. You should just have a little food. In fact, you should have such a small amount of food that you're still hungry after iftar. Not starving, not starving. No, you should have enough where you're not starving. Uh, you should have enough food that you're nourished. You want to have nutrient dense food for iftar. Like one of uh, my sisters was talking to me about the, uh, yesterday about the importance of uh, having nutrient dense food. Um, you know, so I'm saying, you know, feed yourself well, you know, in terms of nutrients, you know, don't starve yourself, but, you know, don't overeat. Otherwise, you won't get the healing. There's healing. There is healing. I'm telling you, there's healing that's just waiting for you if we just, um, uh, if we just allow the physician to do his work, right? Allow the healer to do her work on us, right? Ramadan uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, he has a beautiful poem uh, where he calls Ramadan his tabib, right? His healer, you know? And uh, so our, his doctor. So Ramadan is a doctor for us, a doctor of the heart. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. God bless you all. We'll open up for questions and comments. <laughs> all right, let's see here. Okay, Ibn Isa asks or says, uh, when it comes to the saying, whoever knows their self knows their Lord, is the self talking about nafs or our soul? Also, can we ever know the nature of the soul? Okay, I'm oh, sorry, that was written privately. I apologize, sometimes I... I just read the name. So forgive me if you wanted to remain anonymous. So uh, the saying <clears throat> is a, a very profound saying. And it's, it's, it's an ancient saying. Uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians from Kemet, uh, it was written on their temples. Man, know thyself. Right? The ancient uh, Greek philosophers had the same teaching. Taoists, Buddhists, you know, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, right, uh, you know, of the Vedic path, what's called Hinduism, uh, same teaching. Uh, know yourself. Like, that's the most important thing, is to know yourself. And it's, it's, it's strange that all these religions, I mean, it's difficult to get religious people to agree on anything, Right. But all the religions agree on this. The highest knowledge and the most beneficial knowledge is to know yourself. Now, the Muslim tradition added something to that, right? And this is a saying uh, that's attributed to Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, but it cannot be authentically attributed to him. Um, so it's part of our oral tradition. Um, we don't know for sure that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said this. God bless him, grant him peace. Um, 
But nevertheless, it's, it's attributed to him and many, many, many of our great scholars, uh, many of our great scholars quote this saying, man arrafa nafsahu, arrafa rabbahu. Wa man arrafa rabbahu, arrafa nafsahu. Whoever gains a deep knowledge of the self knows their divine master, the divine nurturer, knows God. So the path to knowing God begins with knowing yourself. And then some of the later spiritual masters added, man arrafa rabbahu, and whoever knows their Lord, whoever knows their divine nurturing master, their creator, will know themselves, right? So to know the self, you have to know God, because he created the self. And the self is a mirror for the attributes of God, right? Now, what, what self are we talking about here? So the self that's being talked about here, uh, my friend, is the higher self. That if you know your higher self, your highest self, the purified self, then you will know God. Because the lower self is a reflection of the demonic realm, right? the demonic realm, and predatory animals and domesticated animals. All of that is kind of mixed in with the, the, the lower self. Demons, uh, predatory animals, and domesticated animals, right? To varying degrees, depending on, depending on the person, right? Your second, so, so that's what's meant here. Um, and by soul, you might mean spirit, I think. I usually use the word soul for ego, but in English, you know, soul and spirit are synonyms. And so that causes some confusion. But uh, if you did mean spirit when you said, uh, or our soul, then yes, you're correct. It is through knowledge of the spirit that one knows God which is your highest self. So the highest self and the spirit are pretty much the same thing. At that level, the spirit uh, and the self really lose their distinctions because now the self uh, is, has been purified. <clears throat> and so it takes on the qualities of the spirit or reflects the qualities of the spirit. The spirit is like the sun and the higher self is like the moon, a full moon. Can we ever know the nature of the self? Yes, yeah, but that, that nature is taught to you by God, right? You, um, yeah, a, a, a deep, deep knowledge of the self comes through divine illumination, right? Yeah, so the answer is yes. Uh, another question, private. Uh, Wa alaikum salam. Would you please elaborate on the purpose of our nafs with respect to the role of our bodies and our spirit? I missed this explanation you gave before. The Quran describes those who forget Allah as oppressing their nafs or the ego, right? So he's asking uh, about the purpose of the ego self like the owner of the beautiful garden in the chapter of the cave the 18th chapter of the quran how does the quran use the term nafs in that example right so imam al-ghazali uh one of our great spiritual masters and sheikh muhyiddin ibn arabi and another great spiritual master, they describe the, the self, the nafs, the ego, as the child of the body and the spirit. The word for spirit in Arabic happens to be masculine and gender. Right? Arabic is a gendered language. Words are masculine or feminine. And it's not just happenstance, it's not arbitrary. There's deep, 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 deep wisdom in why a particular word is either masculine or feminine. Uh, but we don't have, those of you who've taken Arabic classes with me, 
uh, know I've spoken about that before, right? Why is the word qalam masculine, but the word waraqa, uh, I'm sorry, the word pen, qalam in Arabic is masculine, but the word for paper, waraqa, is feminine. Why? So there's, there's actually a deep science and extensive science to that. The ruh, the word ruh is masculine. And the word nafs is feminine, right? So the idea here is that the ego should be re receptive. If you've, any of you who've studied, um, uh, there's a really amazing book called The Tao of Islam, a source book on gender relations, I think, in Islam by Dr. Sachiko Murata. She's a Japanese uh, scholar Jap and a Japanese Muslim. Uh, she, li she lives in New York. She teaches at Stony Brook uh, with her. And her husband is uh, Dr. William Chittick, who has been mentioned quite a bit uh, during this course. <laughs> May God preserve both of them. Um, and she, has, she wrote this book, The Tao of Islam. And she has a number of books on Islam in China and Chinese Muslim sages. Uh, amazing works, just really amazing works. And, um, you know, she talks about this a, a lot, that the feminine principle, right, like the earth, um, it expresses the principle of receptivity and the principle of creativity and regeneration. The earth is a perfect metaphor for this, right? Because the earth is the, the mother, right? The mother earth, Gaia. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the purpose of the self, my friend, is in its best, best case scenario, is to receive light, to receive guidance from the spirit, right? Of course, the spirit receives guidance from Allah, from the divine, from the creator, from God, Dios, right? And then the, the self receives that light, that guidance, that joy, that bliss from the spirit, and then it gives that to the body, right? It's a, it's a, it's a bridge between the, the, the body and the spirit, right? Because it really comes out of their uh, union, right? So, you know, the, the self comes from the union of the body and the spirit. Also, the purpose of the self is to give you some resistance, right? Those of you who, who work out either at home or outside or at the gym know you don't get stronger without resistance, right? When you're lifting weights or you're, you're doing Pilates or, you know, calisthenics, you need some resistance, right? In order to, to get stronger, to build muscle, right? <laughs> the nafs gives you that resistance, right? The nafs gives you that resistance. And so uh, that allows the, the spirit to actually um, cultivate your body and your mind because of the push and pull with the self. Yeah. Now, the nafs is a really interesting word in Arabic because it's, it's related to a word that has a, a common, that shares its root, nafis. It's that which is precious. And so as for the, the owner of the beautiful garden in the chapter of the cave parable that you're asking about, he's oppressing his most precious uh, part, right? The most precious part of you. That nafs is very precious. Um, and when you oppress it, it means that you are denying it the peace and the happiness that come from surrendering to God and from gratitude, right? That was his mistake, right? That he saw his garden as somehow 
his own you know work his own doing and he was you know he edged god out right he edged god out and he he thought that that garden would last forever but only only god is everlasting right ultimately in, in an absolute sense so hopefully that helps right so oppressing the nafs means you know, wronging the soul right and and when you read the Quran, the nafs is really it's interesting the way the Quran talks about the nafs. There 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 are books on this that go into a lot of detail, but it's seen as this responsibility. You have a responsibility to cultivate and grow the nafs, and its its cultivation and growing is very similar to how you cultivate a, a plant in a garden. But if you don't cultivate it, if you, if you neglect it, or if you bury it, God says, and the one who buries it, who neglects it, is destroyed. Then that is oppression. Because the nafs is meant to be cultivated so that it's beauty. Right? The nafs has beautiful aspects. The ego has beauty in it. And it also has ugliness in it. As we were told in many, many places in the Quran. So our responsibility is to channel and discipline uh, the energies of the nafs so that they are a constructive, beautiful force in the world, in the universe, and not one that's destructive. So that our science, our technology, and our art, and our politics, our economics can uh, be a benefit to others. Uh, according to Google Translate, heart in Spanish is corazón, and Portuguese, uh, coracao. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. <laughs> coracao. All right, thank you for that. So cor, right? So cor in French, cor is a, a, a cure, rather, is heart. So I see the common root there. Uh-huh. And of course, your heart is your core, right? Your core. So, oh, you ask, can I repeat the question? What question was that? Okay, I think, so the question that was asked earlier, uh, Brother Suhail, when it comes to the saying, whoever knows their self knows their Lord, is the self talking about the nafs or our soul? And what I think the questioner meant was spirit. Also, can we ever know the nature of the spirit, of the soul? Yeah. Okay, that was the question I think, I think you're referring to. And then there was a question about the role of the self with respect to our bodies and our spirit. And um, in what sense was the Quran, was God using the term self and the example of the man who owned the rich, the, the, the beautiful garden and the chapter of the cave. Uh, okay, and uh, Adeola, says salam zimam wa alaikum salam how do you recommend we navigate the balance between being content and being complacent jazakallah khairan wa yakum i may god reward you with goodness so contentment uh means that you're satisfied with what god gives you Complacency, and we could even throw in apathy, is not using what God gives you for goodness, to strive. Right? Right, so contentment is to be content, to be satisfied, to be happy with your allotted uh, sustenance, whether that is spiritual sustenance or material or, or emotional or intellectual, right? Complacency is not to use those gifts. And that, that's, I think that's a, yeah, I think that's how I would, you know. So you know, not using the gifts is an oppression of the, of the self. Not using the gifts that God gives you is ingratitude. In the Quran, the Muslim tradition, the highest form of gratitude 
is to use God, the gifts that God has given you, the talent that God has given you, the knowledge that God has given you, to use that to help others who don't have those gifts. That's the highest form of gratitude, right? Like, you know, one of our brothers, you know, he, um, you know, he, you know, every year he goes and um, to Pakistan and uh, helps give free eye care to those with eye diseases and with blindness, right? You know, I mean, that's using your gift, you know. You know, giving sight to people, giving light, helping, you know, light come into the lives of people who've spent their whole lives in darkness. Like, that's gratitude. That's a form of gratitude. You know, spending your money, spending your time, spending your knowledge with those who don't have time, who don't have knowledge, who, you know, don't have money. That's gratitude, right? So I think that's the difference. And if someone knows a better way to articulate that, please, you're welcome. Zainab, yes. Yeah, uh, yes, Sachiko Murata at Story were good. Do you know her, Zainab? Uh, I haven't met her yet. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. Maybe you can introduce us. <laughs> Maybe I would love to meet her and Dr. Chittick. Okay, you live in New York. Wonderful. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to meet them. Um, okay, as Brother Suhail, uh, Jazakallah, no need to repeat the question. Got it through the answer by the cell. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I do a lot. I'm glad that was helpful. Yeah, you should not, and I, you know, I should never, we should never rest on our laurels and we should never, um, you know, Imam al-Ghazali has a really beautiful statement about sabr, which is also a misunderstood concept by uh, some Muslims. So sabr is this idea of endurance, of uh, perseverance, of steadfastness. But we often translate it as patience. And for many people, patience is something that's very passive. Patience means I'm not going to do anything about the situation. Patience means I'm just going to, um, what, uh, how would I say it? Patience just means I'm going to resign myself to the way things are, you know, and, uh, and not ch change things. Imam al-Ghazali uh, says, and this is actually, you'll find this if you have a copy of the Ihya al madin his book, the, uh, the Revival of the Sciences of the Way. Uh, he says, he, he talks about this in his section on gratitude. So this is his, the, the, the chapter on gratitude. He spends some uh, time talking about sabr or fortitude, right? You can also translate it as fortitude. Um, Imam Suhaib Webb translates it as resilience, which I think captures part of what sabr is, but it's not, I don't think, you know, cap comprehensive enough. Grit, in English, we have this word called grit, to have grit, also captures an aspect of suffering. It's a big word. It's a virtue. It's a great virtue. It doesn't just mean patience. But, but patience, you know, there's an aspect of patience to suffer. He says, Imam Ghazali says, you only have suffer, right? You only accept and persist with, with things that you cannot control. So if there's a situation, if there's a circumstance, or even a person in your life that is causing discomfort, hardship to you, and you can't change things, like maybe some of us are experiencing with our family members right, during this stay at home order, right? Uh, you may have family members that irritate you. They get on your nerves, right? They've gotten on your last nerve. You don't have any more nerves, right? Um, you, but you can't change them. 
and you can't go live somewhere else. They can't live somewhere else. So you have supper, which means you accept you can't control this particular thing in your life, but you continue to strive and persevere in goodness, in your projects, in your work, in Ramadan, in observing Ramadan, right? That person having supper with them doesn't mean you stop what you're doing. Having supper with them doesn't mean you just go, you know, hide in a closet in your home. No, having supper means I'm going on with my life and I'm just going to endure this, you know, and not complain uh, about it, not, you know, vent and, and, and rant about it um, unless you really just have to get something off your chest, which I talked about already, which is acceptable, especially if you're being uh, harmed or oppressed or abused emotionally or um, physically or, you know, whatnot. So, so yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of people confuse sabr with apathy and complacency. No, sabr is things are hard, but I'm still going to move. I'm still going to move forward. That's what sabr is. Inshallah. Khair. I think that's it. Alhamdulillah. Um, thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. Um, I don't know if the polar vortex is behind us or not. But again, we pray. Allahumma hawalayna wa la alayna. Oh Allah, let it go around us and not fall upon us. Alhamdulillah. And uh, pray for my garden. We, we planted a garden. Some friends came and helped me plant a garden. And we're really worried about the plants um, dying from the cold. <laughs> so pray for my babies out there in the dirt. Alhamdulillah. So we'll close with a prayer. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, wa wa Allah, we ask that you... Uh, subdue our lower selves for us, that you purify ourselves for us, that you purify our hearts for us, that you bring our hearts to life, uh, that you connect us with spirit, O oh Creator. We ask that you connect us with spirit, that you connect us with spirit. We ask that you grant us knowledge of our highest selves and grant us knowledge of you and grant us knowledge of your beloved prophets and messengers. O oh God, O oh Creator, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, O oh most loving, O oh most merciful, we ask that you bless us in what remains of this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful month of Ramadan. We pray for those that are suffering, that are sick. We ask that you give them relief, that you give them health, that we pray for those that are serving, our, the healthcare professionals that are serving those that are sick and those that are shut in. Uh, we pray for a cure, Ya Allah from uh, COVID-19, a cure that doesn't have any adverse side effects. Uh, oh, oh Allah, oh Allah, we ask that you uh, bless us to find and to experience the night of glory, the night of destiny, Laylatul Qadr, that's better than a thousand months. We ask, oh Allah, that you make the last half of Ramadan this year better and more elevated than the first half was for us. Help us to strive seeking you even more. We ask that you make us selfless servants of humanity. We ask that you make us selfless servants of humanity. We ask that you make us selfless servants of humanity. We pray for those that are living uh, in, the, in the heat and the, and the trauma of war and conflict and insecurity. And we, we pray that you make us a means for alleviating that suffering. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we pray for the oppressed wherever they are, and we, uh, and we pray for the oppressor, that you stop them from their oppression, that you rectify their states, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala sirina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisifun wa salam ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa rahmatika. Ya Rahman rahimeen. Assalamu alaikum.